Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Leia with Headwater Science Institute. Welcome to Lunch with a Scientist. We're just a little delayed today. We had a quick uh, technical difficulty, but we're here and we're always adapting to things in this crazy pandemic time. So today we have Noelle Patterson from UC Davis. She's a great scientist who's gonna to talk to us about hydrology. But before we get into Noelle's talk, I have a couple exciting Headwaters updates to share with you. So this next week, uh, we are very excited. We're gonna be doing three different interactive activities for younger children on our Facebook and our YouTube. We're gonna put out some videos um, of science activities that you can do from home. So please tune in next week. We've got some great things going on. And then following that, we also have a really exciting free screening of an independent film called Picture a Scientist. It's a documentary about gender equality in science. It's totally free. We can accommodate as many people as want to watch. So please share this with your friends and family. We think it's really important to start a conversation with your classroom or people at home about gender equality and some of the changes that we've made in STEM careers. So if you wanna register, all you have to do is uh, give us your email address and then we'll send you a link to watch. The short link to register for tickets is bit.ly slash HSI dash science film. Last, before we bring Noelle on, I just wanna thank the Nevada County Relief Fund, great community organization that has funded our free online learning programs. Thank you so much for your support. So, Noelle Patterson, our speaker today, is a PhD student at the University of California, Davis, studying hydrology with a focus on rivers and stream flow. For the last year, she's lived in Reno, Nevada, where she's closer to her study sites on the Truckee River. And her particular interest is in how stream flow interacts with ecological systems and how human management of rivers can change these systems. So I'm going to introduce her right now. Hi, Noelle. Hi there. We're so grateful to have you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. And cool that you get to live near your study sites mm -hmm. in Reno and in Truckee, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's been a great place to live for the last year. Well, we are very excited. Without further ado, I'll let you get into your talk. All right. Thank you, Leia, for the introduction and everybody for tuning in. Again, I'm Noelle, and I'm speaking today about rivers and trees of the Truckee River Basin. And the direction I'll take during this presentation is to start upstream and we'll work our way downstream together, starting with what is a watershed. And then we'll go more specifically into the Truckee River Basin and some of the history around this basin. And then finally get into my research, which focuses on cottonwoods of the lower Truckee River. So starting with what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land that collects all incoming precipitation, that's either rain or snow, then snow melt, and routes that to a single water body. And so you can think of a watershed basically as a big topographic funnel. And any bit of water that lands and runs off of that area of that funnel all gets routed to the same place. And this is a map of the United States split into the major basins that <clears throat> make up our country. And if you're local to the Reno Truckee area, like I am, then your home is in the Great Basin, this basin that I have circled. And what's really unique about the basin we live in is that it's terminal, or the fancy word is endorheic, which means that our basin does not have a natural outlet to the ocean. And so every other basin you see here either routes directly to the ocean, such as these seaboard basins, or routes to a major river system, such as all of these basins that connect to the Mississippi River, which then eventually does route into the ocean, into the Gulf. And you can visualize that a little better if you look at a map of the country with all of the major rivers shown as these blue streamlines. 
And you can really see how rivers make up the veins of the landscape when you look at it this way. And you might recognize some of these major river systems. There's of course the Mississippi River system, the longest river in the United States. There's the Colorado River, one of our major Western US rivers. There's the Columbia. And you'll notice that if you start at almost any of these blue lines and just trace it down to its end, it's going to eventually end in the ocean. But the exception to that is here in the Great Basin where all of these river lines are pretty much disconnected from anything around it that would go to the ocean. Here again is the outline of the Great Basin. And so where we are here, the funnel has essentially been cut off on the bottom. And so the only natural outlet of this basin is through evaporation water that's evaporating off the surface. And there's many different scales of basins. And I'll mention, I use the words basins and watersheds pretty synonymously. They're, they basically mean the same thing. Um, so we're looking here in the top left at the Great Basin. Again, this covers nearly the entire state of Nevada and parts of a few surrounding states but you can zoom into a more specific area. And this is a, a sub basin or watershed. And so here, this is actually the, the combination of three watersheds that sort of make up one unit. And you can zoom in even one more time. And what we have here in this overall green outline is the Truckee River Basin. So if you live in Reno or Truckee, or some of the surrounding areas, this is your home basin or watershed. So that's just the basic what is a watershed. And next I'll talk in some more detail about the Truckee River Basin and give my research some more context. And I'm going to start with a quiz. So this is mostly for those of you who are in this area or familiar. And the question is, where does the water in our watershed the Truckee River Basin end up naturally. You have four options. There's Washoe Lake, the ocean, Pyramid Lake, or Truckee Meadows. So take a second to think about it. And the answer is Pyramid Lake. So again, is part of the Great Basin, where in this area that has no natural outlet to the ocean. And I'll show some maps that will let you see where Pyramid Lake is within our basin if you're not familiar with it already. So here we are, this is the Truckee River Basin and some background information about it. The major river within our system is the Truckee River. And so that has its start at Lake Tahoe. It runs down the River Canyon through Reno Sparks metropolitan area and then naturally empties out into Pyramid Lake, which is the natural end of the watershed. The river runs for about 120 miles from its source to its sink. The basin is about 3,000 miles squared. And it's important to note people have lived in this area for a long time. This is the traditional territory of the Washoe and Northern Paiute indigenous people. And again, I mentioned that a watershed is basically a topographic funnel or bowl. So if you're standing here, for example, in Reno area, there's mountains and hills on all sides that make up the rim of that bowl that you're standing in. And if you live in this area, some of these mountain ranges might be familiar. There's of course the Sierra Nevada over here. There's the Carson Range, the Virginia Range, where Virginia City is. And if you're a Reno local, then you might know and love Peavine Mountain up here to the north. And here's just a, a picture, um, picture tour going down the watershed, starting with Lake Tahoe and the Sierras. And so Lake Tahoe is fed by the mountains immediately surrounded by it, and is of course the the beautiful, iconic river that everybody knows and loves. 
And then the Truckee River exits out of Lake Tahoe. It's the only natural outlet of Lake Tahoe. And as it winds through the River Canyon, it picks up some tributaries along the way. And a tributary is just a river or stream that feeds into a major river. And so in this case, there's several tributaries to the Truckee River, including the Little Truckee River, Steamboat Creek, Prosser Creek, and a few others. And you'll see in these pictures, if you look closely, this, this stream, this is Prosser Creek, has a dam on it as well as this dam on Stampede Reservoir. And so these dams actually can regulate how much of this tributary water enters into the Truckee River. So it's a way of being able to regulate the flow, regulate how much water is moving through the river. And then of course, the end of the basin is Pyramid Lake. And this is a terminal lake. Again, we're in a terminal or endoreic basin. And so the only natural outlet to Pyramid Lake is through evaporation. And you might have been wondering, uh, looking through this map, what this little blue flow line is just splitting off from the Truckee River. And so I said there's no natural outlet besides Pyramid Lake, but this is an artificial or human-made outlet to the watershed. So here at this point, there's a dam and canal system it's called Derby Dam, here's a picture of it. And that routes water or diverts water out of the Truckee River, takes it through this canal, that's this blue line, and here's a picture of it, there's the water, and routes it south into the next basin over, the Carson River Basin, where it's primarily used for agriculture. You might be wondering if there's this big diversion taking water out of the Truckee River, if there's any sort of ecological consequence of that? And the answer is yes, there has been um, historically and currently. And of course, if you're diverting water from the Truckee River and that's what feeds Pyramid Lake, then the lake levels in Pyramid have been affected by that and have been lowered over time. So this is a picture of Pyramid Lake. You can see where the water level might have been higher historically. And this is really important for many reasons, but two of those reasons are these two fish species. These are endemic fish species, meaning that they only live in this local region in Pyramid Lake. And these are the Lahontan cutthroat trout, which is a really popular game fish. It grows to be a huge size for a trout, up to 40 pounds. And this fish, the kiwi, is a sucker fish. You can tell by that funny sucker mouth it has. And so those also grow to a large size and they're culturally important fish species. And their populations have suffered because of lowering of Pyramid Lake because of these diversions from the Truckee River. So there's a lot of people that um, focus on these issues and are thinking of solutions. And here I wanna show a graph that represents that whole situation. And there's a lot happening here, so I'll unpack it one bit at a time. First, I want you to focus on the blue and the green lines here. These are just filled in lines. And these are representing stream flow at two points along the Truckee River. This blue line you can see here is up higher in the watershed, so a higher point in the Truckee River and the green is a lower point in the Truckee River, and that's after diversions have already been taken out from Derby Dam. So when you see there's a lot of blue behind the green, that means that the green or the lower part of the river is flowing much lower, and there's been a lot of diversions at that point. And so this graph is going all the way back to the early 1900s, and 1905 is when Derby Dam was completed on the river. And at that point, for a while, there's complete, um, complete diversions removed from the lower river. And then here you can see as time moves on, there's still pretty significant diversions. The green or the lower river flow is much lower than the higher river flows. 
And about the only time that you have pretty much equal flow in the higher and lower river points is here at these spikes where there's a, a major storm in that case. And you just can't quite di divert all of that water when it's rushing through during a major storm like this. So those are the river flow levels. And now I'll bring your attention to these orange triangles. And that's the elevation of Pyramid Lake. And the axis for this is on the right side here in feet. And so the original lake levels of Pyramid are up here in the upper left, that's pretty close to 3,800 or so. And at the point that the diversions start to occur from the lower river, you just see the lake level is plummeting in Pyramid Lake. And there was actually a point where the Lahontan cutthroat trout that live in the lake went extinct and were later restocked. But the lake level even continued to drop after that. And in more recent decades, some water has been restored to flows through some litigation. There are lawsuits and um, a lot of this was spearheaded by the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe coming in to support these endemic fish species. And so there is some recovery in the lake levels, but here the end of the graph is showing the last few years of the the widespread drought in the Western US. And so at this point, the lake level is not even much higher than those all time lows it experienced. And so this has been a historical and is a continuing environmental problem. And when Pyramid Lake is affected, that's also affecting the lower Truckee River. And that is where I do my research. And that leads us directly to the research that I do, which is on the cottonwood trees of the Lower Truckee River. So again, the Lower Truckee River is pretty much describing the half of the Truckee River that starts downstream of Reno Sparks and then continues out to Pyramid Lake. And it's a pretty different feeling river than the Upper Truckee River. These are pictures from the Upper Truckee River, sort of between Lake Tahoe and Reno. You see a lot of lush green areas and steep canyons. There's trees all over the place. But when you get to the lower Truckee River, it's a very different system. You see it looks pretty dry and deserty out here. The hills are pretty bare. The river is also at a, a lower gradient, so it's less steep than the upper Truckee River. And there aren't very many trees around, as you can see, no pine trees at all. And these trees that you see occasionally spotting the river here are cottonwood trees, which is what I study. And I love showing this picture of cottonwoods to illustrate, this is on the Truckee River, lower Truckee River. And you can see in this environment, it's just completely desert and all surrounding sides, except right here through the river corridor where you get this belt of green that just extends out following the river. And so you can see how the Truckee is really the lifeblood of this area, bringing life to the desert. And so a little bit of background information about cottonwoods. They are the only native tree that grows along the lower Truckee River. There are willows, which are more of a shrub, but the cottonwoods are really the only tree. So if there's any forest, native forest at all, it's going to be cottonwoods. They're a riparian obligate tree, which means that they require water to survive, which is why you see that they're clustered around in the floodplain close to the river and they don't really grow outside of that area. They're a pioneer species adapted to disturbance. And so the disturbance in this case is primary, primarily flooding. So if you had a huge flood rip through this area and clear out all of the vegetation on these sandbars, then cottonwoods would be one of the first species to come back and start repopulating these bare areas. So that's what a pioneer species means. It's the first one to come back. And the survival and reproduction of cottonwoods is dependent on stream flow patterns. 
And so they're a really great species for someone like me to study who's interested in how rivers interact with living things. They have this really tight interaction with the river. And cottonwoods are also important because they provide habitat for a lot of the species that live along the lower Truckee and more generally provide habitat for forest species all across the Western US. And on the lower Truckee, there have been bird surveys done finding just tons of bird species that are supported by cottonwoods on the lower Truckee. There's many different kinds of songbirds, but there's also larger predatory birds as well. And in one of my field sites in particular, when I'm out there in the morning, I almost always hear owls. So I definitely know that there are owls and predatory birds out there. And they're important for the fish too. Of course, not in the sense that the fish are living in the trees or the forest, but the cottonwoods that live right along the river banks shade the river. And that actually keeps the temperatures significantly lower in the river. And these fish species need a particular temperature to survive. And if the water gets too warm, this is detrimental to their health. And so cottonwoods are also supporting the fish species. The Pyramid Lake fish do travel upstream and throughout the lower Truckee River. So it's important for them too. And so this all leads to my research question, which essentially is how do stream flow and river management affect cottonwood health? And when I say river management, I'm thinking about the ways that humans manage and alter the river. So think about Derby Dam where those diversions are taken out or even these upstream reservoirs that affect the flow that moves through the Truckee River. And here I'm showing the field sites that I have set up along the lower Truckee. These red stars here are my upper sites. And so these are all three above Derby, Derby Dam and where those diversions are taken out. And then I have two sites that are below the Derby Dam diversions. And so what I expect is by having sites that are both above and below the dam that I can see if the trees are reacting any differently to their environment being either affected by that dam or not. And here's a few pictures. These are from my sites above the dam. And here's some pictures of the sites below the dam. And it's really a, a pretty nice area. You have the river and the trees around. So it's been a nice place to go out and do my field work. And here I'm showing my research methodology. Put really simply, what I plan to do is to pair hydrologic data or data that describes the river with ecologic data or data that describes the cottonwood trees and bring those together to search for relationships. And so a really simple example of this could be that more water in the river uh, respond or causes higher growth in the cottonwood trees. That's just a simple example. And there's, of course, a lot more detail that I can go into with it. And so I'll describe a little bit more what I mean by hydrologic and ecologic data. Starting with the hydrologic side, I will be getting my river data through United States Geologic Survey or USGS river gauge stations. And so a gauge is just something that measures. So this is a river measurement station. And here's a picture of what these generally look like. This, this little box is the USGS river gauge out here measuring what's a really beautiful river in the Western US. And these gauges collect a few different kinds of information. Um, and I have that listed out here, one of the primary being stream flow. And so stream flow is just the amount or the volume of water passing by a certain point in a given time. And in the US, one of the most common units of measurement for stream flow is cubic feet per second. So that means at a single point, such as this gauge, how many boxes of water those cubic 
feet size boxes are passing through that point in one second. And to give you a sense of scale on the Truckee River, when it's low, that might be between two and 300 cubic feet per second. And when the flows are high, it can be 1,000 or even more cubic feet per second. And the gauges also collect other information sometimes. And that includes river stage. That's just the height of the water. So if you were standing here next to that gauge, how far below your feet is the water? Or if you're in a flood, how many feet above you is the water? And they also sometimes collect temperature data, the temperature of the water, and sometimes different water quality parameters such as pollutant concentrations or dissolved oxygen for a couple examples. And so this is data that's already provided by USGS and I can just download and use. And here's an example of what some of that stream flow data can look like. This kind of graph is called a hydrograph, just think water graph, and it shows flow over time. So here the flow is in cubic feet per second on the y-axis. It is in log scale, but doesn't have to be. And this is looking through about one year. I picked a gauge on the lower Truckee River looking over the last year. And so you can see back in last fall and until spring, the flows were pretty low. They were just between two and 300 cubic feet per second. Then the flows get much higher when you reach the spring snow melt period when all of that snow in the mountains starts to melt and it routes into the river, creates a big pulse of flow. And then that gradually recedes back down until about the fall period again. And so this is about where we are right now, um, around 400 cubic feet per second at this gauge. Oops. And here I want to also show ecologic data, what I mean by that. And so what I'm using for my ecologic or tree data is information from tree rings. So this cross section here is what you would see if you basically cut a tree down and looked straight down at that stump. You would see the rings that grow out each year as the tree gets older. And so again, that's one ring per year. So you can tell how old a tree is by counting its rings. You can also tell a lot more information by those rings. And so I'm not going out and cutting down every tree that I see. I'm actually taking just a small sliver of data from that tree. This is called a tree core. And so it's just a small sample that I can take. It's a non-destructive method, destructive method that only causes minor damage to the tree and gives me all of that information describing the tree's lifetime. So looking at the tree core, the center here represents the very beginning of the tree and that first ring is the first year of life of the tree. And then you move all the way out to the most recent years of the tree's life. And what I'll be looking at specifically in these rings is the width of each ring. And so a wider ring means the tree grew more in that year. A narrow ring means that it grew less in that year. And this shows my basic setup for how I collect and use that tree ring data. So first I go out into the field to my sites and collect the tree cores. This black T thing is showing my increment bore. It's kind of like a hand operated drill bit that I twist into the tree to extract the core. And then I take all of those tree cores to the lab where I measure the width of the tree rings. And that will give me a whole set of tree ring data describing the lifetime of each tree I sample. And this, this is what it could look like. This is just a simulation. And so there might be some years where the growth is much lower and some years where it's much higher. And this is the data that I'll pair with my river data to search for patterns. And so I'm in the middle of this project right now. So I just wrapped up this first step, which is 
going out and collecting the tree cores in the field. And so I'm about to start on the next step of measuring the tree ring widths. But I'll show you a little more about this first step because this is what I've been working on all summer. And so this is me out in the field doing my field work during this last summer and fall. And I'll show you the general steps to collecting these tree cores. So I go out to each of the trees that I've selected to sample and this blue handled instrument is the increment bore. And so this is what I take to the tree and then start screwing it in counterclockwise. And this black shaft is hollow and so it's cutting through and creating that tree core as I twist it in. And then when I have the bore about halfway through the tree, then I remove the sample using this metal instrument it's, that I'm holding in the picture. It's called a spoon and you just insert it in and scoop out the tree core. And so this piece on the end, that's the wood sample, that's the tree core that I'll then analyze. And then I just screw out the increment bore in the other way, counterclockwise, to remove it from the tree. And there is a little hole and the tree will naturally recover from that but I just put a, a little stick in the hole and that's to prevent any insects from coming in causing any damage. Um, this is what the US Forest Service recommends it, for their procedures for doing tree cores. And there's a lot of fun that you have in the field, things you learn that you don't expect you'll learn. And I wanna show this video that I, I took in the field. And so, after collecting a tree core at this tree, it started just spurting out water, kind of like a fire hose. You can hear it splashing, it gets quite a lot of water. And so about one in 10 trees or so would produce a bunch of water like this after I would take the tree core. Oh, that's, that's it. Um, and it actually kind of smells bad too. You, I didn't expect that, but I started calling it tree pee because of that. And it makes you kind of think about trees differently, not just big pillars of wood, but they're kind of like giant columns of water, um, giant water towers. Um, so that was a fun discovery. And here I'm showing my research expectations basically what I'm thinking I might find out from my research once I analyze the data. So this is just a little mock-up I made, which could describe what happens if my hypothesis is correct. And what I'm expecting is that combination of hot, dry years if with water extraction from Derby Dam will cause reduced growth in cottonwoods. And so that would be a combination both of the stream flow being low, so that's this blue line, might dip down low in some years. And when the temperatures are hot, that can create more water demand by the tree. So when it has this combination of both less water available, but more water demand, that's where I'm expecting the tree growth will be the lowest. And so this green line would represent the expected tree growth as measured by the tree rings. And if this situation is what I do end up finding, this has pretty serious implications for the cottonwoods because with climate change, we're expecting in the Western US to have, yes, hotter temperatures, but also more variable precipitation. So wet seasons can get more wet, but the dry seasons can get hotter and drier. And so this would put cottonwoods at a really vulnerable position where they might have reduced growth or even death. And so it's important to think about what the future might hold as I analyze this research and see basically what the cottonwoods are saying. And thinking more about the research implications. So the ways that I hope the data that I collect and analyze in the field will result in um, would be to inform flow management practices 
an increased understanding in general of cottonwood flow interactions. And so by informing flow management practices, the Truckee River is a highly managed system. Again, there's the diversions at Derby Dam, and there's also these upstream reservoirs. And so these can all be managed to make different decisions about how much flow or water is in the river at a certain time. And rivers all across the US are managed both for human needs and ideally also for environmental needs. And so we know the human needs, we know what we need, but to know how much water the environment actually needs requires research like this to create a more clear understanding between river flows and how species respond and interact with those flows. And so that wraps up my presentation. I wanna thank you all for listening and leave you with this picture of the cottonwood and the beautiful fall colors. And I'm happy to take any questions you have. Great, thanks, Noelle. You're welcome. That was really fascinating. Uh, for those of you watching, if you don't know, Headwaters is located in the Truckee area. So it's always nice for us to hear about something happening right near where we're centered. So mm -hmm. um, well, I have a kind of a general question to kick us off here. I am curious, and I'm sure some of the watchers are as well, that you study hydrology, but your focus is mm -hmm. trees. And so you talked a little bit about how these systems are connected. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about how hydrologists maybe don't just study water, they study the whole mm -hmm. system. Yeah, definitely. And I'll say that as a graduate student, in my first two years, I focused much more directly just on rivers, just on analyzing stream flow, like that hydrograph I showed. And the ultimate goal of that research I did was to connect it closer to the species that depend on the river. But at that point in my research, I didn't have a really clear link. And so this research is a way for me to kind of set that link more clearly. Um, part of why we really care about learning about river flow and how to best manage it is because a lot of rivers in the Western US, for example, have sort of shortchanged the environment and we've had a lot of native river species such as fish species and riparian or species that live around the river have suffered population declines or even extinction and so one of the really important things about understanding river flow is how that flow affects these natural organisms. And so the way to really get that clear link is to go out in the field and start to observe and learn more about those species. And so even though I'm not an ecologist primarily by training, it's sort of brought me into the ecology world because that's what it takes to really understand how rivers and the environment interact. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at the whole system. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And so moving into this specific project, uh, how long does the research process take from the project design to sharing your results, which as you mm -hmm. said, you haven't even done yet? Yeah, yeah. And so this will all take place in the course of my PhD, which an average PhD student in my program at UC Davis takes between four and a half to six years usually. And with this project in particular, I began conceptualizing the idea about a year ago while doing other things at the same time, but formulating the idea, setting the field sites, deciding what data to collect, and so I've, from that point until now, gone from conceptualization to collecting the data. And the next steps of um, lab work, then measuring and analyzing and interpreting the results, I expect will take another one and a half to two years. And that's one and a half to two years while doing other projects as well. But it does take a, a few years to really reach idea to hard results for a project like this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it's a big, yeah, it's a big process. Mm -hmm. 
And one thing that I'm lucky about is that the USGS already works on collecting and curating all of this river data. So I don't have to do as much on that side. I just download and use the results. But in some cases, it can take a really long time to establish a project that determines relationships on decade scales. It can take long-term monitoring. And that's why having a network of USGS gauge stations across the country is so important to research in general. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering to add on to what you just said, uh, we're talking about how there are some established systems and maybe some new systems in your research. Mm -hmm. For example, you showed us your technique for plugging holes in the trees. Mm -hmm. About what percentage of your research or your work is, is new procedures that you're creating? versus following procedures that maybe have already been done by other scientists. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I think with a lot of research projects, it's often taking methods that have already been developed in some sort of aspect and applying them to what you do. And so the whole science of using tree rings to find out information about a tree is called dendrochronology. And it's fairly well established and you can use it to determine how, how trees interact with water for water availability. But in terms of the forest service, they have the protocol like the stick in the tree and stuff. And that's often used for um, different purposes such as seeing how trees respond after a fire or, fire, or sometimes just for forestry, how to identify the best and the most dense trees to use for logging for industry. In my stream flow analysis part of my research, I am using a stream flow analysis tool that I created as part of my first two years in my PhD program. And so it is exciting to be able to use something that I developed. It's a software tool essentially but often it's just the creative application of a bunch of different methods that you bring all together for the system that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Interesting, a big network of scientists working together. Yeah, you can't do it alone. Uh, yeah, so this question here from Curtis goes back to the initial discussion of the watershed as a whole. Um, so what have the diversions in that watershed been used for recently? And if they have been used for agricultural purposes, has that changed the chemical makeup of the river water over time? That's a good question. And I, so as far as I understand about the Derby Dam diversions, those are used for agriculture near the town of Fallon in Nevada. And I have some information that I've given in other presentations, but that water is actually routed into the Carson River. And from there, it's used for hydropower as well. It's used for some um, electricity generation, but then the, the final use of that water is for agriculture. And I don't have a really specific understanding like what they're growing out there, um, what exactly they're using it for, but you can look and see the amount of water being diverted over time because that is also gauged by the USGS. And I wouldn't expect that taking those diversions affects the water quality as much in the, the Truckee River as it might in the Carson River where that water is actually ending up, but it could sort of change the balance in the Truckee River. And even outside of those diversions, there are water quality, um, issues and attention given to water quality on the Truckee River. There's some groups that do science on the Truckee River. I think the, the Truckee River Watershed Council does a lot of work on water quality. And so that can be affected from things such as human roads and infrastructure that then create runoff that goes into the river and changes the quality. And so I would expect things like that change the quality more than the diversions itself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
And so still continuing to talk about river flow, uh, this time with the Truckee River. Once you have your findings about what flows make the Truckee River more healthy, how do scientists like you then share that information to help other organizations create policies to make better management decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say there's a few different routes that this information takes. Um, one of the primary ways that just scientists share information in general about their research is through authoring papers or scientific publications. And that means that the research is reviewed by peers or other scientists. And so this gives your research credibility so that people aren't just taking your word for what you say, but what the scientific community in general is agreeing on as research, as information. But then in addition to just that is coming up with relationships with organizations. And so that's something that I've started doing on this project and do have more work to do as well. But I've partnered with the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. I have some of my sites on their property and they also are an important stakeholder or a, a player in the Truckee River. And so they kind of know about this research that I'm doing and that I will have results that might show how the cottonwoods in their lands are affected by these river diversions. And I've, so I've started creating relationships with them, with the Nature Conservancy, reached out to a few other groups and agencies, and it's going to just be a continual project as I progress in this research, just connecting in with organizations that have a decision-making um, influence on how the Truckee River is managed. Mm, I see. So to bring it back, I think we've talked a lot about um, interdisciplinary studies and how different organizations work together, especially in science. We're sharing all this research with other scientists. And I, I do like to kind of end on this question fairly frequently. How can people who feel inspired or passionate about your work get involved on a small scale on their own? Mm -hmm. And I think rivers are a great example to use too when thinking about that sort of question, how you can get involved, how you can learn more. The Truckee River has community groups that are based on stewardship of the river, even recreation of the river. And so there are community cleanup events that are sometimes um, scheduled as well as citizen science. And so I do know that there are some opportunities for taking water quality samples along the Truckee River and contributing to some of the long-term monitoring and science of the Truckee. And a lot of major rivers in the United States will have some sort of water quality or river council or for example, like friends of the Truckee River, friends of the Yuba River. And so there's always going to be some sort of community around these rivers that people appreciate and value. And just being out on the river is a really great way to learn and understand it more. And we're pretty lucky in the communities in Truckee and Reno to have the river right there through town so that you can spend time on it and appreciate it and then value it more through that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you feel passionate about this, please look up some of those organizations and Noelle and I will see you out on the river. Mm -hmm. And with that, I wanna thank you Noelle for sharing your brilliant research, um, for being here to tell the public more about hydrology. And if you're in the Truckee or the Tahoe or even Reno area, you'll have more appreciation for the cottonwoods after this talk. <laughs> yes, go hug a cottonwood today. Yes, hug a cottonwood. <laughs> Thank you, Noelle, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. All right.